ladies and gentlemen, let's bring it up for Hutch. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. You can take that with you. Gentlemen, how's everybody doing this morning? Blessed. Blessed. Good, good, good. Good to see you. Good to, uh, to be seen. It's good to be back here at Cabernet. And uh, as we wind down here, I pray that God has something great in store for each and every one of us. If you have a Bible with you this morning, or maybe you have it on a phone or a tablet or whatever, be finding your way over to the book of Exodus chapter 2. It should be fairly easy to find. If you go to the front of your Bible, there's a book called Genesis. The very next book is called Exodus, and then there's a chapter 1 and a chapter 2. So you can get over there as quickly as you can, and we're going to get into the Word of God as we start a new series that I'm going to be doing this fall called Moses, Man on a Mission. Today's focus is God's Got a Plan. And it'll fit right into the announcement that uh, Ryan just made for all of us as well. Now, I have two questions I want to ask you on the front end this morning, and I don't want you to, to verbally answer me. I want you to just think of your answer and keep it to yourself for just a second, all right? Question number one, do you feel, do you think that our culture is growing closer to God or farther from him? Do you feel that our culture is growing closer to God or farther away from him? With that answer in mind, answer this question to yourself as well. Have you ever considered the fact that how you see the circumstances of your life is very important? Have you ever considered the fact that how you look at the circumstances in your life is very important? One thing that I'm learning as I grow older and as I am maturing in my faith is that if I am to be spiritually healthy, I must have a biblical perspective on the circumstances that not only happen to me, that go on around me in the world in which I live. And that has to be based on the rock solid truth of the revealed word of God. That is the lens through which I have to look at the circumstances of life. Now, before we take a dive into Exodus chapter two, before we start this series, I wanna give you just a thumbnail sketch of a little bit of background. And I hope and wanna and encourage you to go back and study a little bit on your own. Read Exodus chapter one. It's a great bridge to Exodus chapter two. But when we get into Exodus chapter 2 and Moses comes onto the scene, the backdrop of the story is this. Some 400 or so years earlier, Joseph uh, had called his family, Jacob, his dad, his 11 brothers, to come and join him in Egypt. Now, we did a series on the life of Joseph, and I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and follow up with the last message or two in that series to kind of bring you up to speed. You'll remember briefly that, that Joseph was, was um, a little bit prideful, to be quite honest with you, and his 11 brothers despised him. They despised him to the degree that they sold him into slavery in Egypt. Think about that. Brothers putting coin in their pocket to get rid of a problem which just happened to be their own flesh and blood. Now, here you are, you're Joseph. You're down in Egypt, a place where you've never been before. They're speaking a language you don't know. And through a series of events, you're falsely accused and thrown into prison and for 13 years, Joseph is in a prison in Egypt. And he's innocent the entire time. And yet God was at work in Joseph's life all 13 of those years. So that when he was called upon to interpret Pharaoh's dream, he came up out of the prison and God lifted him up to the pinnacle of Egypt to become the prime minister, the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on the face of the planet at that time. And because he was in that position, God used him to save a remnant, his family, from starvation. So Jacob and his 11 sons and all of their families are brought into the umbrella of Egypt because of Joseph. 70 in number, Exodus chapter one tells us. 
When Exodus chapter 2 erupts on the pages of Scripture, that tiny little remnant of 70 has now exploded 400 or so years later to about 2 plus million Hebrews cocooned in the nation of Egypt. Pharaoh takes a look around. He's concerned. He begins to think to himself, you know what? If an army comes to attack us because the Hebrews are now our slaves, they're going to turn and they're going to fight with our enemies against us. I got to do something to put a stop to this. And so he sets in motion a game plan to not only try to reduce the number of Hebrews, but to significantly slow their growth down. Well, his first two attempts fail miserably. Read about it, Exodus chapter one. His third attempt is this, to deputize every Egyptian citizen to put to death on sight every Hebrew baby boy they see. It is into that world Moses is born. Verse 1, Exodus 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. The birth of Moses was one of the most significant events in all of Hebrew history because he was the greatest man of God born in the 2,000 years between Abraham and the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was born somewhere around 1525 B.C. And in the first 10 verses of Exodus chapter 2, we begin to learn some things about him. We learn that he had an older sister, Miriam, and an older brother named Aaron. And as soon as Moses was born, the Bible tells us, we just read it, Moses' mother recognized there was something special about him, that that she recognized there was a God-given sense of destiny about this baby boy. Verse 3, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She, she made it watertight. She put the child Moses in it and placed him among the reeds by the riverbank and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. When Moses' mom put Moses in a basket and placed him in the Nile River, the odds from our human perspective were against him. If a typical loyal Egyptian found him, he would be drowned. If a Nile crocodile found him, he would be lunch. But aren't you glad this morning that we serve a God who is not limited by human expectations, and situations. Verse 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside the river, her attendants are there overseeing what's going on. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. Verse 6. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Now, don't pass over that too fast because there is nothing less than a miracle that has just taken place. Pharaoh's daughter certainly knew her father's edict was to put the Hebrew baby boys to death. And yet when we read this text, we read very quickly through it, but I want you to notice a few words right here in the middle of this text. It says in verse 6, she took pity on him. Pure and simple, this is a sovereign act of God. Right here, the Lord sovereignly turned this ungodly, heathen woman, her heart towards this little baby 
And she had pity and compassion on him. Verse 7. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Yet here is another sovereign act of God. Moses' own mother gets royal permission to not only keep her son alive, but to nurse him and to nurture him in the most tender and important years of his life. And she gets paid to do it. This is God at work. Pharaoh's daughter was the, was the only child of Pharaoh and his wife. History tells us that that made it through to adulthood. So she's the next heir in line for the throne of Egypt. So here in Exodus chapter two, when she fishes Moses out of the Nile, historians tell us that she was really quite young. Let's go on, verse 10. When the child grew older, she, that is his mother, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Pharaoh's daughter adopted Moses as her own son. She brought him up in the palace and he was treated in every way as a member of the royal family. Why? Because he was adopted. So he got all the rights and privileges of being a part of the royal family. Archaeology has provided us with an amazing confirmation of the biblical account we read here in Exodus chapter 2. You see, in Exodus chapter 2, we get the clear impression that during the reign of this Pharaoh, a guy by the name of Tutmos I, that the royal Egyptian family was living in a palace beside the Nile River where a young girl could go and take a bath in the Nile and where in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 11, an older Moses could be walking around the palace and see an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and step in and put it into it. Now, from history, we know that the formal Egypt palace was in the 18th dynasty, the time of Tutmos I. It was actually in the part of Egypt called Memphis, which was about 13 miles south of Cairo, about 100 miles south of the Goshen Delta where the Hebrews were living at the time. You say, Hutch, why in the world are you telling us that? The reason I'm telling you that is because for centuries, scholars looked at Exodus chapter 2 and said, see, you can't trust the Bible. It's unreliable. It can't get its facts correct. And for centuries, that was the belief. Oh, but in 1993, it's a good year. <laughs> Dr. Manfred Biotech, who was an eminent archaeologist and a, and a professor of Egyptology at the University of Vienna in Austria, He's over in Egypt. He's doing a dig, and guess what he happens to discover? He just happens to discover in 1993 a huge palace complex at a place called Tel El Daba at the time of Moses. And the important thing is, is that Tel El Daba is 100 miles north of Memphis and just so happens to be right alongside the Nile River, and it's right where the Goshen Delta was, which is where the Hebrews were living. In other words, he unearthed this palace from the time of Moses right where the Bible said it was going to be, beside the Nile, near the Goshen Delta, just like the Bible said. Now, uh, 
another prominent archaeologist called Dr. Bryant Wood said this, and I quote, the discoveries at Tel El Daba strikingly corroborate the accuracy of the Exodus account. Moses most likely played among these buildings as a child, walked the halls of these palaces as an adult, and confronted Pharaoh here with God's message, let my people go, end quote. The bottom line is here this. For thousands of years, the Bible has been historically correct and contemporary scholarship has been historically wrong. The truth is, and I love this, the more they dig up out of the ground, the more the Bible is proven to be true. Now, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior, and one of the hurdles for you to overcome is whether or not this book is trustworthy and reliable, this simple truth ought to go a long way to helping you to overcome that obstacle of your faith. You see, the Bible has been subjected archaeologically, historically, and text critically to more tests in the last 150 plus years than any other book ever written. And every single time, not only does the Bible pass the test, it passes the test with flying colors. And the reason I say that today is this, because the Bible, if it is historically and archaeologically correct, you can rest assured if it goes to all of the the trouble to be historically and geographically correct in every way, it's not going to lie to you about spiritual truth. So you can take the word at what it says. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior for what he did on Calvary's cross as payment for your sin, I want you to know today that the only people who are going to go to heaven according to the scriptures are those who have had the shed blood of Jesus on Calvary's cross applied to their account. You'll see some shirts around here that say, to tell it, to tell, you know what I'm saying, to tell us die, right? It is finished, paid in full. It's an accounting term that says it is done. That's what Jesus did for you on Calvary's cross. And you need to accept that as the forgiveness and payment for your sins. So if you're here today and you've never done that, I hope, I pray, I beg of you before it's eternally too late, trust Jesus today. Give your life to him. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Make me a brand new man from within. Because you can trust the Bible. You can trust the Bible. Now, I know what you're thinking. Saying, Hutch, you're getting all worked up. You're sweating like a pig. That's because it's hot in here, for one thing. Now he turns it. I'm getting ready. You're done. And he's now he's turning it down. What difference does all this make for you and I today at work and at home? Really, what difference does it make? We've already said that Moses was raised in a royal palace in Egypt. He was treated to every benefit and blessing of being a part of the royal family. These privileges, I want you to understand, that Moses enjoyed and included having the very best education that was available in the world at that time. He received all the instructions necessary to be a member, a high-ranking member in the royal family of Egypt. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting that Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, the first martyr for Christ, in Acts chapter 7, in that moment of being martyred, listen to what, Moses, what, what Stephen had to say. Acts 7 and verse 22. And Moses was instructed, highlight, underline, circle this phrase, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and highlight, circle, underline this phrase, he was mighty in his words and deeds. Moses was a force to be reckoned with. Remember that in Egypt in that time, there was no public education. The only people who got educated were those who were part of royalty. But because Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, he was royalty. And as a result, Moses was taught reading, 
and writing and arithmetic. He was given the very best in the languages of the world of the day. He was taught military strategy and, 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 and business organization and leadership. Stay with me. I don't want you to miss this. I, I'm trying to do the best I can to convey it. And I wish I could just open you up and pour what God's poured into me into you. And I, don't, I can't do that. And I know you're looking at this through a different lens. But know this today. God was at work in Moses' situation every single step of the way. Why? Because down the road, God was going to call Moses to be the human instrument through which the Holy Spirit would record. You may know these books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He had to know how to read and write to do that. God was gonna call Moses to use the organizational skills necessary to lead 2,000 plus people through the Sinai Desert for 40 years. He needed the, the training in warfare because God was going to call Moses to prepare the Hebrews to be a fighting force to go into and take the promised land. And what I want you to see with me today is, is that in the first 10 verses of Exodus chapter 2, we cover 40 years of Moses' life. But the most important thing to understand is, is this. God did not waste one single experience in those 40 years of Moses' life. Every single experience he had, for good or for bad, from our perspective, was preparing him for what God had for him in the future. Now we're going to take a break. We're going to go to the tables. We're going to have some lively discussion, I believe. And in just a few minutes, as we wrap up today, I want to come back. I want to tie all of this together in a nice little bow and give us all a practical word, actually three words, as we leave today. God bless you as we go to the tables. You know, it's easy for us to sit around our tables this morning and looking back at Moses' life, it's easy for us to put the pieces of the puzzle together to make a beautiful picture. But I wonder if 3,500 years ago, Jochebed, Moses' mom, could see that picture. I wonder if 3,500 years ago, Moses' dad could see the puzzle of Moses' life. I, I wonder, could his older sister and brother, Miriam and Aaron, see what God was, was doing? I, I wonder if Moses, in the midst of all that was going on in his life, could see it himself. Truth is, I doubt very seriously if anyone in his family could see what God was up to. But the truth of the matter is, is through it all, God was in complete control the entire time because God had a plan and God was working that plan out. But I want you to consider with me this morning, Moses is not the only person who ever asked this question. God, where are you in all of this? As a matter of fact, King David, before he became king, he's tending his father's sheep on the backside of the desert. 
And one time a lion comes to attack his sheep. Another time a bear comes to attack his sheep. I can imagine David out there under the sky saying, God, what in the world are you thinking? What is, I'm just doing my job tending my, my dad's sheep. And then one day, a couple of years later, he's standing in the valley of Elah with a sack of rocks in his side, a sling in his hand, and a giant before him over nine feet tall. And I imagine that David at that time began to see some of the pieces of the puzzle falling into place. It's starting to make sense. You prepared me with a lion and with a bear because you knew one day I would stand before a giant and before all of the armies of Israel, you would give me the victory. Joseph, we talked about him earlier. Just one of 12 brothers who made a profit by selling him into slavery. He's working in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife makes googly eyes at him. Says, come lie with me. Not just once, but regularly. And Joseph on a day in which she reached out to grab him, leaves his coat, his cloak behind, and runs out of the house. He's falsely accused, thrown into prison. He interprets dreams in the prison. The baker and the butcher, they forget about him. And for 13 years, not 13 minutes, not 13 months, 13 years, he's in a prison cell. And then one day, the warden comes, Joseph, Pharaoh is calling for you. He believes you can interpret a dream. And so, so Joseph gets cleaned up. He's been in prison for 13 years, a hole in the ground, basically. He gets cleaned up, he goes up, he interprets the dream. And God takes him from a prison cell to the very pinnacle as the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on the face of the planet that day. The Apostle Paul always had in his heart to go to the city of Rome. Everything in Paul's day revolved, emanated from Rome. He wanted to go to Rome, preach in the Colosseums, give an invitation, see hundreds, thousands, place their faith in Jesus Christ. But for two years, he's in a Caesarean prison cell. Then he's put into chains and shipped to Rome. God, where are you in all of this? Until one day he's standing before Emperor Nero and he tells the emperor, the most powerful man on the face of the planet at that time, about who Jesus is and what Jesus did for him. And then in a prison cell every day on a rotating basis, the praetorian guard, the very best of the best of Roman soldiers is chained to the apostle Paul. And he's talking about Jesus and he's singing about Jesus and he's praying to Jesus and he's telling them about Jesus and they're coming to faith in Jesus and then they're leaving to serve their country all over the world knowing Jesus is their real and personal savior. And the apostle Paul says, I'm so glad it didn't come the way I wanted it to come because God has given me favor and the pieces of the puzzle are fitting together. Nick Vulicic is a young man who was born without limbs, no arms, no legs. At the age of eight, he attempted suicide, and understandably so. But today, Nick Vulicic has written eight books. He speaks to hundreds of thousands of people face-to-face -face every year, sharing the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with them. It is said that he has spoken face to face to over a billion people. And he's just now beginning to see the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. Many of us here today as followers of Jesus Christ, we think we have to understand everything. As men, we think we need to be able to explain everything. But what we need to do 
is to see life, our life, our circumstances, just the way we look at Moses, where the pieces of the puzzle fall into place at just the right time and in just the right way because we have a sovereign God who is in control of everything. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Bible says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God says, trust me. I never, ever, 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 ever waste an experience. It could be a hurtful experience. It could be a harrowing experience. It could be a hallowed experience. It doesn't matter what the experience is. There was not a single experience in Moses' life that wasn't producing in him something that God had for him. God didn't waste an experience with Moses. God didn't waste an experience with David. God didn't waste an experience with Paul. He didn't waste an experience with Nick. And he is not going to start wasting an experience with you. And he's not going to start wasting experiences with me. Because God never makes mistakes. Think about this this morning. God never utters the word oops. Never. He doesn't make mistakes. So Hutch, what does this boil down to? Let me give you two things, three words, two things. That all of this that we've talked about boils down to today. Number one, relax. Relax. Everything is under control. Number two, trust him. Number one, relax. Number two, trust him. Would you say that with me? Number one, relax. Number two, trust him. Let's say that again. Number one, relax. Number two, trust him. God's got this. Guys, that's our job description in a nutshell. Our job description isn't to have it all figured out. Our job description isn't to have all the right answers. Our job description isn't to wander through life and try to be as safe as we possibly can. We need some wild men for the Lord Jesus Christ who are wild in their faith, but they're relaxing in the fact that they know there is a sovereign God who's got all things in control. And he knows what he's doing. And the truth of the matter is, is he had everything in your life and in my life worked out before we were ever conceived in our mother's womb. And one of the distinguishing marks of a true man of God is that no matter what is swirling around the world and around him, he remains calm and relaxed because he knows he can trust God because God is in control. I want you to think about this with me for just a second before we close. What you look at, you will see. What you look at, you will see. If you look at the chaos and the confusion all around you, that's all you're going to see. You're going to stay up at night worried. Is the stock market going to crash? What's inflation going to do to my retirement? What in the world are we doing leaving behind Americans in a foreign country? And we're going to worry ourselves to death. I'm not saying don't pray about it. I'm not saying do what you can do. But while you pray and while you do, relax and trust him. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this exciting study in the life of Moses that we have but begun today. I pray that you would give us insights that we have never seen before, not only into the book of Exodus, not only into the life of Moses, but into us into our journey of faith. Help us to grow. Help us to mature. Help us to be so passionate in our pursuit of you that no matter what winds blow, no matter what storm rages, no matter what chaos and confusion circles around us, we can relax and trust you. 
That's our job description. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, guys. Thank you. Next couple of weeks, Ron's going to be back, and then I'm going to come back and do part number two and three back-to-back in this. The next time we get together, we look at Moses. The title of our study together is God and My Failure. I don't know if you've ever failed. Chances are I'm looking into the sets of eyes of every single man, and you could point to at least one failure in your life. You know what Moses' failure was? Killed an Egyptian, hit him in the sand. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Killed an Egyptian, hit him in the sand. He knew what God's will was, but he did it in his own way and in his own time. But God used it still. It's going to be a great study as we study the Word of God. Hey, listen, if you'd like some dog treats, give you my my 30-second. I got some of these. These are made by adults with disabilities that we work with. I got a few bags, 12 bucks a bag. If you'd like some, feel free. If not, no worries. I'm going to leave this one right here as a gift to anybody who comes and gets it. But uh, it just helps provide uh, meaning and purpose for adults with uh, disabilities, which we love to work with. Looking forward to next week. Ron will be back. We'll see you then. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.